Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, nice rainy day to be inside doing hyperbolic geometry. Our, um, oh, let me widen the screen. Hang on a sec. Okay. Um, so my goal for um, this week, the main goal is to prove some theorems about dynamics on hyperbolic surfaces. So, um, so X will be a, a finite volume hyperbolic surface or orbifold. And then on the unit tangent bundle of X, we're going to have a couple of flows. We're going to have the geodesic flow and we're going to have the horocycle flow. And there will be the main theorem we're shooting for is that um, both flows are mixing. Okay, so in preparation for that, I want to continue to make some general remarks about hyperbolic surfaces and orbifolds. So if you were a, a Lie theorist, if you thought of your primary object of study as being a Lie group, then instead of talking about in this language, you would use the language you would be studying the group G is SL2R or perhaps SL2R modulo plus or minus the identity, the isometry group of hyperbolic space. And, um, and then instead of studying X, the primary role would be played by this group gamma because this space is nothing more than this double coset set space gamma mod g mod k. So, um, so from that perspective, the natural hypothesis to put on gamma is first just that gamma is discrete. And this, is, this places us in the general setting of the study of discrete subgroups of Lie groups. So I just want to say a few words about going back and forth between these languages. So in general, if you have a discrete subgroup of SL2R, then you do get this object, which is the quotient of X by the action of gamma. And if gamma were to act torsion free, then this would be a covering map and H is simply connected. So when we form this quotient, we get an isomorphism between the fundamental group of X and uh, gamma itself. And the language of orbifolds is invented so that when gamma is not discrete, the space is not quite a surface. It has the structure of an orbifold. And orbifolds have fundamental groups as well. And this, this remains then true, uh, provided we allow orbifolds. And if you're, if you're cautious about orbifolds, um, then you can make X into a surface by requiring that gamma is torsion free. So for this to be torsion free is the same thing as saying X has no orbifold points. It's an ordinary surface. But let's continue with the, with the general setting of an analysis of discrete subgroups of SL2R. So in that case, we have this identification of between the fundamental group and the elements of G. So let me just say what that says about the geometry of X and the representatives for elements of its fundamental group. So, so the theorem is that given G and gamma, which is isomorphic to the fundamental group of X, either one of the following things holds. Let's suppose G is not equal to the identity. So the most common case is that G is hyperbolic as an element of SL2R. So it stabilizes a geodesic. It's conjugated to the diagonal group A. Um, and then there exists a unique geodesic 
gamma contained in x representing the conjugacy class. Um, uh, g and pi 1 of x. So remember that to give a loop freely on x is to give a conjugacy class in pi 1. And then in negative curvature, every non-identity element that is represented by a hyperbolic element uh, is, all, is actually represented by a unique geodesic. There's a unique loop of shortest length uh, iso uh, homotopic to this, um, this loop G. Um, so that's what happens in the hyperbolic case. And of course, the way you get this geodesic is you go up to the, to the hyperbolic plane and then G stabilizes a unique geodesic up there. And then you map this down to X and uh, you get the corresponding geodesic on the surface. Now there's one other case which uh, which uh, happens frequently, which is that G is parabolic. And in this case, um, there exists a family of horocycles. We call them eta of S contained in S, X. Um, with the length of eta of S equal to S, which is allowed to tend to zero, uh, rep again representing the same um, the same uh, element of the fundamental group of X. And the, the, the standard case to think of here is just take the upper half plane modulo Z goes to Z plus one. So this is an example of a parabolic Mobius transformation. And this quotient space is isomorphic to the punctured disk. The, in fact, the isomorphism is given by taking e of z to e to the uh, minus 2 pi i z. Or e to the plus 2 pi i z. Sorry, so the imaginary axis goes towards the origin. Um, and a fundamental domain for this action is, of course, the strip, say, between the lines of x value minus a half and a half. And as you go, the, the horocycles, eta of s, correspond to the horizontal lines at a given height. And notice that if you're at height y, then because the metric is z over y, the length of this horocycle in the hyperbolic metric is is not one, as it is in the Euclidean metric, but it's one over y. So s is equal to one over y here. And as you go higher and higher in the hyperbolic plane, these get shorter and shorter. And the picture is that in terms of hyperbolic geometry, these two geodesics here are actually asymptotic to one another. And they, they correspond to a single geodesic in the quotient space. So here's a picture of the punctured disk in its hyperbolic metric. And this line here goes to say this line here. And then these horocycles go to curves like this that are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So in this case, if you tried to find a geodesic in the homotopy class corresponding to G, you wouldn't be able to find it. What would happen is you draw a loop and you try to make it shorter and you can make it arbitrarily short. But to do so, you would have to eventually leave every compact subset of X. And I should say that the way the surface really looks, that it, there's an infinite amount of volume near the boundary of the punctured disk, near the circle, but there's a finite amount of volume near the point uh, zero. So if we call this n is equal zero in the usual coordinates on the unit disk, then this part of the surface has finite volume. And in fact, it's a, it's a beautiful fact that when you have a, a region that's bounded by a horocycle, if this is a horocycle and this has length L, then the area 
of this infinitely round, this exponentially narrowing tube is just equal to L. And you can easily check that by integrating the hyperbolic area uh, in, in the region above the line at imaginary z equals y and between these two lines here. Um, okay, so that's another thing that can happen is that elements of the fundamental group might not re be represented by geodesics, but in that case, the Riemann surface can't be compact. And there's some sort of finite volume end of the Riemann surface corresponding to those elements of pi one. And then finally, I'll just say briefly, if G has finite order, then this corresponds to an overhole point. And of course, in this case, G has a unique fixed point in the upper half plane and the image of that fixed point uh, gives a cone point on the quotient uh, orbifold. Okay, so now notice, as I mentioned, when X is compact, neither case two nor three can occur. And so in that case, um, uh, every element of the fundamental group is represented by a closed geodesic except for uh, the identity element. Okay, so that's just a little orientation. Um, let me also say that when X has finite volume, Kurt, sorry, what, why can't case three happen when X is compact? Oh, I'm sorry, if X is a compact surface. Oh, okay. It can happen. Okay. Right. So in the, in the most, uh, so the, you know, the most routine case in hyperbolic geometry is the case of a compact surface. Adding, allowing orbifold points is just a little icing on the cake. There's a fundamental difference if you allow finite volume because then the quotient is, uh, is necessarily non-compact. This is called, by the way, a cusp of the surface X. Um, and I, I just want to mention more generally, so if, if X has finite volume, and let's say it's a finite volume hyperbolic surface, then you can write X as, uh, uh, well, let me say it this way, there exists standard horrible neighborhoods of its cusps, V1 to Vn. And we start by saying the, uh, the it, the, and in particular, N, which is the number of cusps, is finite. Uh, such that X minus the union of these bi is compact. So if X, if X has finite volume, a typical picture is like what's drawn here, and you can cut off a neighborhood of this cusp, and then what's left over is a Riemann surface with a Horus circle as, as one of its finitely many boundary components. And there's a slightly more general statement that describes the thin part of X in general. What, one thing that's special about the cusp is that the injectivity radius of X is going to zero. There is no embedded ball of large radius when you're far out the end of this cusp. The other way that can happen is if there's a short geodesic on the Riemann surface. So I won't state the thick thin decomposition. I'll just say that in general, the thin part of the Riemann surface consists of either cusps or collar neighborhoods of short geodesics, again, with boundary components of definite length. So if you remove those, you're left with a Riemann surface of injectivity radius down or below. Um, okay, so let me give you an example of this, which is kind of neat. If you take uh, H mod gamma of two, what does this look like? This is, as I mentioned last time, it's the triply punctured sphere. Um, one way to draw it is you put two ideal triangles next to one another, and then you glue this to this, and you glue this to this by the obvious um, translations. And the quotient is a is a uh, is geometrically a triply punctured sphere. It has three cusps. And now it's a well-known uh, fact that if you put a horrible resting
focusing on each rational number in the upper half plane. So if at the point Q over Q, you construct a horror ball whose diameter, whose height is one over Q squared, that you get a beautiful packet of the upper half plane. So we, so at infinity, we put this horror ball, we have infinity, here we put BP over Q. This is say the case P over Q is zero over one. So we put a, a ball of height one, this is Y equals one. And then at the integer uh, one, two, et cetera, you continue to put unit balls. And then in between two of them, say here, you have the point three halves. So you put a ball of height one quarter and it perfectly fits. And then here, you have another point, um, say, uh, let's see, what was I doing? So one plus a third, four thirds. <laughs> so four thirds, I put a ball of height well, one ninth and so on. I get a perfect packing of, uh, of the upper half plane by maximal aura balls. And when I pass to the quotient space, since these are disjoint upstairs, they give rise to horror balls down here on the correctly punctured sphere. So that's an example of this decomposition. Here's B1, B2, and B3. And now an interesting question is, so here's a, here's a sort of beautiful natural figure in mathematics. Um, and you can see that there's a region left over here. Actually, there's two triangles, one on the front and one on the back. That's what we get after we remove these standard horrible neighborhoods of the cusps. And you could ask yourself, what is the area of T? This natural region. It looks pretty small. It's the area of one of these interstices here or here. What was, what do, what's its hyperbolic area? Well, its hyperbolic area turns out to be the fractional part of pi. In other words, it's 0 0.1415926, etc. Um, and here, these horror balls are bounded by horror cycles of length 2 because gamma of 2 is generated by the matrices 1, 2, 0, 1 and 1, 0, minus 2, 1. In particular, it's, it includes the element c goes to c plus 2. That's this element here that's identifying the two opposite sides. So when we, when we apply gamma of 2, one of its generators to this packing, it translates this point to this point. So the length of this corresponding horror cycle here is 2, because it's going from the point i to the point i plus 2. And so the area of the region above this is, uh, is also 2. So in fact, the area, the sum of the areas of these bi's is equal to 6. It comes out to be an integer, whereas the area of the quotient surface as a whole is a 2 pi times its Euler characteristic. Now, what's the Euler characteristic of the triply punctured sphere? Well, the Euler characteristic of the sphere is 2. You remove three points, so that's minus 1. And so the total hyperbolic area is 2 pi. And so what's left over is two copies of this triangle, and it, their area corresponds to the difference between pi and 6. And there's two triangles, so the area of one of them is the difference between pi and 3. One reason I bring up this example is that it's optimal in the sense that if I want these horribles to be disjoint, um, the longest I can make their boundary is 2. If I made it slightly bigger, they would start to overlap. So when I say standard horrible neighborhoods of the cusps, what that means is that the length of the boundary of bi is some universal constant L that doesn't depend on x. And, uh, and in fact, the best possible value you can take here is 2. And that's illustrated by the triple punctured sphere. 
Okay. So that's a little background on geometry. And, um, and next, in preparation for doing ergodic theory, I want to say a word about measures. So let's go back to our Lie group G, which is saying SL2R minus plus or minus the identity. Any Lie group has a right invariant smooth measure. In, in fact, it has many of them. The way you do it is you choose a volume form on the tangent space of the identity, and then you just use right translation in the group to move it everywhere. So no matter what G is, it has a right invariant measure. And it also has a left invariant measure. And you might wonder, do the right and left invariant measures agree? So we say G is unimodular. if it has a bi-invariant measure, a measure that's invariant on both the right and the left. And there's lots of nice examples of, of unimodular groups. For example, if G is abelian, right and left actions are the same. So of course, it admits a bi-invariant measure. Another example that's not quite so obvious is if G is compact, but neither of those apply to SL2R. The reason, in some sense, that SL2R is unimodular is that this is a, is, is a simple group, or more generally, a semi-simple group. But let me just, rather than say what the definition is, let me say what the logic is. The real issue for unimodularity is whether or not the adjoint action of G on the tangent space of the identity leaves invariant a volume form. In other words, whether the determinant of the adjoint action is, um, is, uh, is equal to one. So whenever you have a Lie group G, there's a map called get add, which maps G into our star, and it sends, uh, so, so I should say the adjoint action is the map from uh, G into the general linear group of its, of its Lie algebra, or in other words, into the automorphisms of the tangent space to the identity of G, uh, that's, that where G acts by, by conjugation. And if this action, if all the elements of this action have determinant one, that means there is a, a, deter a measure an element of the highest exterior power, which is um, invariant under, under uh, right and left multiplication. So, so why does this determinant add map uh, have image one in the case of SL2R? Well, the reason is very simple. This group is simple. That is, it has no non-trivial normal subgroups. And in particular, it has no characters. There's no map from SL2R to an abelian group except for the identity map. And so that's, that forces it to be unimodular. And this sim simplicity in general forces this determinant add to uh, be simple. So I could say here, unimodular is if and only if uh, that add maps G and two plus or minus one. Okay, so what's good about the having a bi-invariant measure is if we want to do ergodic theory on X, or rather on the unit tangent bundle of X, we're going to think of the unit tangent bundle of X as gamma mod G. And then we're going to take other elements of G, and they're going to act on the other side by right multiplication. And we want there to be a measure that's preserved. So first, we want the measure to go down to the quotient. So it needs to be invariant under gamma. That's what it meant for this to be finite volume, that when you take the standard invariant measure on G, then this quotient has, also has finite measure. And on the other hand, we want the, the right action of G to preserve that quotient measure. So that means we also want the measure to be invariant under the right action of G. And that's the case for SL2R. 
Okay, so we can do measure theory and ergodic theory on the unit tangent bundle because G is uh, is um, is is uh, unimodular. Now I should say there is an obvious measure on the unit tangent bundle of X that's the same as the one that we will be using. So in fact, let me just record this back. Liouville measure on T1 of X is equal to the invariant measure. And to say what Liouville measure is, let's just ask ourselves, how can we pick a vector at random on a compact Riemann surface? So I want to pick a random point in the unit tangent bundle. Well, to do that, I first have to say where the vector is going to sit. So I have to pick a point at random on X. And there's only one reasonable to do that, ways to do that, which is to choose the point at random with respect to area measure on X. So we use hyperbolic area to randomize the point. And then at the point, we have a whole circle's worth of possible directions. Well, so we just choose the direction of the point at random as well. And that's the geometric definition of Liouville measure that would work even if X were an arbitrary Riemannian surface. And it turns out to coincide with this invariant measure. Okay, but that's, that has something to do with G mod K. What about some of our other homogeneous spaces? So we have three other homogeneous spaces, or maybe four, that we like to study. Let me remind you what they are. We can study the upper half plane, which is G mod K. Um, we can study the light cone, which is G mod N. We can study the space of oriented geodesics, which is G mod A. Uh, and we can study the circle at infinity, which is G mod A. And the general theorem is that if G is unimodular, then uh, if G is unimodular, then G mod H has an invariant measure if and only if H is unimodular, that is invariant under the, uh, the right action, uh, the left action of G. So which of these spaces have invariant measures? Well, A, N, and K are all abelian groups. So these are all unimodular, so these all have measures have natural measures on them. It makes sense to talk about the measure of a collection of points in the hyperbolic plane. That's just the area form of the hyperbolic plane. But also, it makes sense to talk about the measure of a collection of four cycles, or the measure of a collection of geodesics. There's a geometrically natural way of assigning measures to those sets. But for the circle at infinity, we already know, we've discussed this several times, there is no SL2R invariant measure. So there's no invariant measure here at all. And, um, and this can be traced back to the fact that this group AN is solvable. It's not semi-simple and this, this uh, adjoint map is not um, the identity and in fact this group is not unimodular. Um, so let me just say uh, briefly how, what these invariant measures are. How would you actually find concretely what the measure is on, say, the light cone or the space of geodesics? And a good way to do that is to think in terms of the Minkowski model. So um, let's, let's do the light cone, for instance. Uh, sorry, the uh, space of geodesics, the one sheeted hyperboloid. So this is defined, this is the locus where Q of x, y, z, x, y, t, x squared plus y squared minus t squared, is the locus where this is equal to y. And we want a geometrically natural measure that's invariant under our group G, which we're now thinking of as xo 2 one Now G acts on R3, or on R21, preserving the volume form V, 
which is dx dy dt. That's because the matrices here have determinant one. So V is G invariant. And Q is also G invariant. I mean, we're, this is the orthogonal group of Q, so you preserve this inner product. And now here's the beautiful idea. Because Q is invariant, so is the one form, DQ. And to describe the invariant measure on G, all we have to do is to describe the volume form on the tangent space to each point of G. And that volume form can be given by a two form, alpha. And in fact, we can take alpha to be proportional to dx dy, since dx dy pulls back to a, um, to a smooth volume form on uh, G, uh, almost smooth, and then to here times some function of x and y. That's, that will be, that's one way to describe our G invariant volume form. And then the key point that we need is that alpha should be G invariant, at least when restricted to the tangent space to G. But for that to hold, all we need is that alpha wedge DQ is equal to V. Because if this determinant, this is invariant and this is, is invariant, then this will be invariant, at least when restricted to the kernel of DQ, which is exactly the tangent space to the space of geodesics. And uh, okay, so that doesn't look so hard. And if you take DQ, DQ is obviously just uh, 2 x dx plus y dy plus uh, a minus t dt. And so if we want, if we take alpha to be multi a multiple of dx dy, then alpha wedge dq kills this term and this term because if there's either a dx squared or a dy squared, and all we're left with is, is minus 2tf uh, um, a dx dy dt. And so what we want is that 2tf should be a constant. I'm not going to worry too much about the sign. Um, and so we simply take f to be equal to t. However, <laughs> we're, we're using x and y as coordinates on g. So we'd like to write down f as a function of f and y, but that's easy because this equation allows us to solve for t in terms of x and y. So the upshot is that the invariant measure on g is given by dx dy over the square root of x squared plus y squared. And let's see, to get t, we have to subtract minus 1. So let me call that minus r, where r is equal to 1. OK, so that's where we're using x and y as, uh, as local coordinates on g. Now, what about if we wanted to do l, or even the upper half plane? which we think of as the one sheet in hyperboloid here, called that allographic H. The only thing that changes in this computation is solving for T. So if we're on the light cone, then X squared plus Y squared equals T squared. So R is equal to zero. And if we're on the one sheet in hyperboloid, then R is equal to minus one. So the invariant measures on G, L, and H are given by this two form with r equals 0, 1, and minus 1, respectively. That allows one to make concrete sense out of the measure of the space of horror cycles with some property. So for example, a nice exercise would be, let's uh, estimate the uh, volume of the set of horror cycles in the unit disk such that the diameter 
of the Horus cycle is bigger than mine. So most Horus cycles are very small. If we require that the Horus cycle uh, has a diameter at least r, we get a compact set of Horus cycles, and this should have some volume that we can estimate here. I won't do that exercise, but just propose it as something to think about. Okay, so, so the next thing to do is to start talking about the dynamics of these two flows, the horror cycle and geodesic flow, not quite on X, but on its unit tangent bucket. But before I do that, I want to just take a cultural pause and think for a moment about relativity, about special relativity, because um, as many people uh, in the audience uh, quickly raise their hands for, <laughs> the Minkowski model should make you think of space-time. It is, in fact, R31 is, in fact, the model for the space-time in our universe in, in special relativity. And, um, and there's a lot of consequences to relativity one of them is that when an object is moving rapidly, well, what does that even mean to move rapidly? It means we then consider ourselves to be stationary and then relative to us, this object, this rod is moving rapidly, that it contracts in length. Now, what, of course, what does that mean for it to contract in length? If you're on this rod, you don't feel any contraction because you think that you are stationary and we are moving. What it means is that when we measure the length of the rod, it comes out shorter than it would be if it were stationary. That is the most fundamental, uh, perhaps counterintuitive, uh, first result in special relativity. Who knows what that's called, by the way? That phenomena, that things get shorter. Length contraction? Honor? Length contraction? Okay, that's true. It has a name associated with it. I think it's Lorentz contraction. That's right. It's called Lorentz contraction. And, and in fact, the idea of having a something like a Riemannian manifold, but where the tangent space at each point has an indefinite inner product instead of a definite one, that's due to Lorentz. So there's so-called Lorentz manifolds, Lorentz inner products, et cetera. They're all ideas of picking up this Minkowski model and using it in differential geometry. So this, this fact that things should get shorter is called Lorentz contraction. I, the history is kind of complicated, so I won't try to justify it. But let me explain why this is true. And I'm going to explain it in a way one of the reasons I want to explain it is I read the account in Feynman's lectures on physics and I found it completely unconvincing. So, <laughs> um, so let me just draw a picture of this Lorentz contraction for, for a rod of unit length. So here's time, here's space, this is us. We think we're stationary. We introduce these coordinates on our space. So, these are all the things that we are ha think are happening simultaneously. We have all the clocks synchronized in the world, and um, this is time zero. And at a later time will be at time t, and we can measure distance on the x-axis. So we take a rod of length one, so this is the origin, this is the point one zero, and then we let this rod just sit here and evolve in space-time. So as the rod moves, it sweeps out an infinite rectangle like this. Okay. So if that's it, I mean, the time, it sweeps out this rectangle, it's not moving. Now what happens when the rod starts to move? Well, one thing we know for sure is that if we focus our attention on one endpoint of the rod, it will give us a line in space-time that's not vertical. And this line will be defined by the equation x is equal to dt, where v is the velocity or the speed. So we know how one end of the rod will move. Um, 
And in fact, we now know, once this rod is put in motion, um, well, we almost know what it will, what it will trace out in space-time. So to figure out what the region it sweeps out in space-time, what we want to do is take the image of this rectangle R under a change of coordinates that moves the vertical line to this line. So we want to find an element F from R2 to itself and set R prime to be F of R. Now what property should F have? F should preserve the Lorentz metric. So it should, should preserve, preserve the quantity X squared minus T squared. In other words, it should be an element of hyperbolic geometry, in this case, the geometry of one-dimensional hyperbolic space. So for example, this vector here, with respect to this matrix, has length one. Why don't we draw the set of all vectors that have length one? That will just be the hyperboloid divided by x squared minus t squared equals one. So it will look something like this. And now the interesting thing is our rod is going to be lying along some other line. But, but notice that since this line here is tangent to the hyperboloid, wherever, wherever our rod lies, first, since we've applied an isometry, the rod will also think it has length one in the, in the Lorentz metric. And so, our, the moving rod will think that it's in a position here. And then the other edge of the rectangle will just be tangent to the hyperboloid at this point, since this edge of the rectangle is tangent, uh, of R is tangent to the hyperboloid. So the, so the picture you get is this. This is what R prime looks like. And what you see is that as this rod passes by us at time zero, what we see is not an object of length one, but we see an object of some shorter length r. And then you do a little computation and you'll find that r is the square root of one minus d squared or b squared over c squared. I'm actually drawing in coordinates where, where c is equal to one, c is the speed of light. And that's, that's why you see this contraction. It's because as you move this line along the hyperboloid, it intersects the real axis in a shorter and shorter interval. And indeed, as you go off to infinity, the length of that interval goes to zero. Okay, now, why does the rod look shorter? So here's the way I like to think of it. For the people on this moving rod, the points here are all happening at the same point in time because they, that, that's the image of what we thought was a bunch of simultaneous events. So this rod thinks that at one given time, it's here in space time. And that means that when we did our measurement, we didn't measure the distance between these two ends of the rod. We measured the distance from this end of the rod at one time, and this end of the rod of a different rod, or the same rod at a different time. So the, rod, the people on the rod think we're making a stupid mistake. It's like you're trying to measure the length of a train, and you mark where the caboose is at one time or where the front engine is at another time, and you measure the distance between the points. If you don't measure them at the same time, of course, you're going to get the wrong answer. So let me, let me just try to elucidate this, this, um, this point with a thought experiment. But first, let me pause and ask, are there any questions about this? I mean, what I should say is that Einstein's insight was that the symmetries of space-time are exactly those that preserve this um, quadratic form and of course the light cone for this quadratic form is is exactly the the diagonal line in this picture and the one going the other way and it represents the space-time course of light particles so the
The onset is that the speed of light is the same in all coordinate systems, which is exactly to say that this quadratic form is preserved. Once you agree that that's the case, you can just see if you change coordinates, then the apparent length of a rigid object becomes less. So any questions on this quick physics lesson? Okay, so I have a, a little puzzle to, for you to think about it briefly in breakout rooms, which is the following. So here's a rather small barn with an open door. And actually there's a door in the back also, which is also open. And then an enormous rocket, a very long rocket, comes shooting through this barn at high speed and exits the far end. So to say this distance is 10 feet and the length of the rocket is 100 feet. But the rocket is going so fast that, that this is its rest length. It's going so fast that when it's in motion, it's only one foot long. And so to create a paradox, the owners of the barn wait until this rocket is inside the barn, and then they shut both the doors. And they say, I've done it. I've trapped a Lorentz contracted rocket. But of course, they want to preserve their barn, so they have to very quickly open the doors and let it go out the other end. But when the, when the rocket is entirely inside, they shut both doors. Okay, the question is, that I'd like you to discuss is what happens from the point of view of the rocket? Does the rocket see some kind of contradiction? How does it come to terms with the fact that what it sees is it is itself a 100 foot long rocket standing stationary and this barn is being fired at it at enormous speed. And not only that, but the barn is not 10 feet wide. The barn has been Lorentz contracted to a tenth of a foot. And so it's going through this very narrow barn and it's very long. So how is that not a contradiction? Okay, so let's go to breakout rooms and just briefly discuss this um, little thought about. Um, okay. Uh, so we'll come back in like six minutes. Are you there, Cigna?
Hello professor. Hello. Yeah. Um, can I share my opinion? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did you go to a breakout room? Uh, no, I didn't go to the breakout room. Okay, you're allowed to go to a breakout room. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Uh, because uh, you had said... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You must have missed the class where I... I gave everybody license to go to breakout rooms at some point. Ah, uh, okay. So, okay, I, I see. Yeah, okay. Next time then. <laughs> okay. Well, you could... Let's see if somebody else says it. And if not, you can certainly say. Or maybe. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I think almost everyone is back, except for some people who may have left permanently. Um, uh, so who wants to report on the conclusion of their breakout room? Well, I forgot to remind you to elect a, rec a reporter. Um, if you are a reporter, if you're, or if you're willing to share what happened in your breakout room. Yes, Benji. Um, so we discussed that the main thing that changes um, is the simultaneity of the closing doors. So when you switch the perspective, um, just like the ends of the um, rod before appear to be at different times, so do the closing of the doors, which means that as the rocket is shooting through it, it doesn't ever think that it's trapped between the very small barn door because the doors are opening and closing at different times. So first it goes through while the back door is closed, which then opens as it continues, and then the door behind it closes and opens. Oh, it goes in, it enters while well, this, this is the back door and this is the front door. Yeah. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so from its point of view, there's the foreshortened, let me just make sure I understood what you said. So there, so it sees the back door closed. It says I'm about to collide with that. And then it, it enters the bar like this, right? Mm -hmm. And then just before it crashes through the back door, this opens. And then they're both open for a long period of time until the rear end finally is inside the bar. And then this shuts behind them. Okay, cool. Yeah. Does, does, does anybody else concur with that answer? And maybe raise your hand if, if you agree with that explanation. I'm not trying to, you know, pass a uniform judgment on anyone. Uh, <laughs> okay, there's Benji. So, Tina, what do you think? You haven't raised your hand yet. Oh, me? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but when our, our our group were talking, I uh, yeah, I wasn't there for a few minutes. I just uh, get to the point that they were explaining the problem, but uh, so we didn't uh, we we didn't know how to explain it with the, the geometry, but the physics. I think they they had the I didn't help them, but they had the same uh, I think argument. Okay. Does anybody have a a different argument or a different thought? or just another comment to add? Sardar, did you want to make a comment? I, I guess uh, uh, I agree with the opinion, yeah. You agree with the opinion, okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so I just, one reason I wanted to bring this up is that this very simple picture over here illustrates exactly this paradox. Namely, this is the bar. It's, this is, we think that we've trapped uh, the rod in the barn right here, but in fact, what we trapped was the front of the rocket at one time, and then the rear of the rocket at a later time, <laughs> as you can see, as you can see from this picture. Um, so anyway, I think this is very, relativity is very simple and it's also very deep. And I think it's really worth thinking about how this very simple picture that we're discussing in hyperbolic, one-dimensional hyperbolic geometry really encodes this huge breakthrough of Einstein in uh, reconceiving how we think about space and time. Okay, so um, let's go on now to our discussion of uh, 
dynamics. Okay, so on the this uh, unit tangent bundle of X, X is now a finite volume hyperbolic Riemann surface. I'm going to first define geometrically the geodesic flow. And the geodesic flow is the obvious thing. Namely, if you have a vector sitting at a point, then you can construct a unique geodesic through that vector, and you can flow along it for a distance t. And, and then move the vector along tangent to the geodesic to obtain a new vector, p, t, and b. So this vector lies over a different point on the surface generally. It's distance t from the point where you started. And the direction of the vector is telling you how to continue the geodesic motion at that point. Um, so for example, what are the closed orbits of this flow? The closed orbits correspond exactly to the closed geodesics. When you have a closed geodesic on your surface, then it lifts to the unit tangent bundle by taking the forward tangent direction and gives a periodic uh, cycle for, for, this, uh, for this flow, and conversely. So, um, so we have this, uh, this geodesic flow. And then there's a slightly different uh, guy, which is, which is called the horocycle flow. HT. And before I explain what the horse cycle flow is, let me also note that we also have something I'll call the elliptic flow. Actually, maybe I'll call this HS and call this E theta. So the elliptic flow is the following. You go to your vector B and you just rotate it through an angle of theta, of course, keeping its length one. So if periodically spinning around the vector without changing the point that it's sitting at is the elliptic flow. And of course that, every point is periodic under that flow. Okay, now here's, the, here's, here's how I'd like to describe the horocycle flow. So here's the upper half plane. Here's our, our tangent vector. And think of this as, as a little car uh, sitting on the imaginary axis. And we're driving straight. So the, so the geodesic flow is just straight motion in your car. But now suppose, unfortunately, you forgot to get your wheels aligned and your car is locked so it always turns very sharply to the right. What's going to happen to your, to your motion as you start attempting to draw, drive along the imaginary axis is you're going to be forced to turn and you turn continually until you come back to where you started. You just go around in a circle. If the car, if it's in really bad shape, you go around a small circle. If it's got a moderate amount of failure of alignment, it goes around a bigger circle. But what's interesting is that when you, if you have enough, if your car is only off by a little bit, then what happens is instead of going along a circle, uh, a straight, instead of going along the imaginary axis, you go along an arc that looks like this, and in fact, it's a parallel of a geodesic. So you don't, it, once the um, curvature of your path is close enough to zero, the car doesn't come back to where it starts. It starts and that happens before you get to geodesic flow. You see, there's a special value, just one particular number where you can set the steering wheel where you will move along not a closed circle in the hyperbolic plane, but a circle of infinite radius. That is, you'll move along a horse cycle. And this 
very special flow mediates between the geodesic flow and this flow where, where we have compact orbits. So this is what we call the horocycle flow, or rather we're going to do it a little bit differently. What we're going to do is given this vector here, the horocycle flow will be uh, not uh, flowing along the, the, not constructing a horocycle that this is tangent to, but rather moving it, the vector horizontally along this standard horocycle, that is the horizontal line with the same imaginary part in the upper half plane. Okay, so, so here's another way to think about the horocycle flow. You take your vector and you move it orthogonal to itself while keeping its destination the same. You see these two geodesics are uh, both tending to the point at infinity. And so in addition to the geodesic flow, there's this horocycle flow with the property that one, you move orthogonal to the vector, and two, the direction of the vector creates a new geodesic which is asymptotic to the original geodesic. Okay, that's called, that's called the horocycle flow. So we have these three flows on the unit tangent bundle. They're defined geometrically, and then the theorem is that the, uh, the geodesic and horocycle flows are mixing. Okay, so for the proof. Quick, quick question. Yes. I maybe I missed something. What does this have to do with the red horse cycles you drew? Like, I understand how you define the horse cycle flow as moving along the horizontal line, but how does it connect to the red horse cycle that kissed the x-axis? Oh, right, right. So, um, right, so let me say that. So, the, so I, I exchanged my definition slightly. It was just a sort of a change of angle. So, so if we take this vector, and if we wanted, we could, we might like to, you might say, I, I hate that definition of a horocycle flow, I want to do this one. So what you could do is you, you first rotate your vector by minus pi over two. So if you apply E minus 90 degrees to your vector, and then you apply the horocycle flow I mentioned, which is where you stay orthogonal to this horocycle. And then at the end, you rotate by plus 90 degrees, then you get your horocycle flow. Uh, does that make sense? So in other words, you could choose to say a vector defines this, and by the way, where, what is this horocycle? What you do is you follow this vector until it hits the boundary of hyperbolic space, and you use that as the base for your horocycle, then you construct the unique horocycle that goes through the point where you started and is centered there. So what I'm saying is this horocycle flow where you would move, um, uh, where the vector would be tangent to the horocycle is just conjugate to the one where it's orthogonal to the horocycle. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So in all of these things, the, the, there are some choices that are being made and I'm, I'm choosing them so the group theory works out nicely, but you can always take one of these flows and conjugate it by one of the other flows or some other automorphism of the tangent bundle, ergodicity and mixing will be preserved. Okay, so the reason I defined the horse cycle in that way is, is that we have the following nice interpretation of these three flows. So the theorem is that under the identification, between the unit tangent bundle of x and the quotient space gamma log g, as always, g is SL2R, log plus or minus the identity, g flows gt, ht, and hs, and e theta correspond to the actions of the one parameter groups uh, a. Uh, and and k. And to be very precise, let me, let me say what the parameters are. So the elements of A are the diagonal matrices. It turns out you want to make 
to get unit speed flow, you want e to the minus uh, t over 2 on the diagonal, because this corresponds to z goes to e to the t times z, which we've seen is unit speed motion along the imaginary axis. And similarly, n, the elements of n should be given by, uh, well, for this, it's no big deal. They should be given by 1s01. And then for k, um, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I think what we want here is, is e theta to be equal to um, cosine, yeah, cosine theta over 2, sine theta over 2, minus sine theta over 2, cosine theta over 2. In fact, this theta over 2 is sort of the same as the theta over 2 in this in this normalization. And the reason for this is that we want e 2 pi to be the identity. And with this normalization, you get cosine pi here, which is minus 1. So you get minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1. But remember, that math is the identity as a Mobius transformation acting on the upper half pi. OK, so the claim is that if you want to understand the geodesic flow, what you do is you think of a vector here as corresponding to an element in this, in the Lie group G here, up to the action of gamma. And then if you want to flow for time t, you multiply by the time t element of the diagonal matrices. And that will give you the, that will move you to a new position in the unit tangent bundle. And what you've done is actually just apply the geodesic flow. OK, so these flows are all instances of homogeneous dynamics. That is, they're instances of league subgroups of G acting on a homogeneous space for G. So when you, when, when you look at the literature in this field, you'll find a fair number of papers that have no pictures at all and no discussion of geometry. Because once you've translated everything into the theory of Lie groups, you can do all your computations with matrices if you insist. But you'll get a lot more geometric intuition if you think about what the meaning is of these statements. So, so uh, Lie theorists might take this as the definition of the geodesic flow. So let, let me just say why it's true. So. <clears throat> What we really want to do is it has nothing to do with the unit tangent bundle of x. It has to do with the unit tangent bundle of h. So if we pass to the universal cover and it's correct, then it will be correct everywhere. Now, both of these flows are invariant under the left action of g. The left action of g on the unit tangent bundle here is just its action by isometries. And since the geodesic flows are defined geometrically, as are the horocycle and elliptic flows, those flows are invariant under the isometric action of G. Here, since you're acting on the right, of course the flows are invariant under the left action of G. So to do the proof, it suffices to check that this is true at one point, that the geodesic flow and the actions of A, N, and K are correct at one point in the upper half line. So my favorite point, I've already given it this way, is the vector pointing up at uh, i in the upper half plane. So as we've already seen, if you take this vector and you apply the geodesic flow, gt to b, then you'll rise a distance of uh, t, which is, means you'll move to the point e to the i t, and the vector will continue to point up. On the other hand, that is the same as taking this vector and applying the Mobius transformation, AT, to the upper half plane, taking the derivative of that and applying it to the vector B. Because this Mobius transformation is just Z goes to E to the T Z. And since that's an isometry for the hyperbolic plane and it preserves this geodesic, um, and it clearly sends i to i times et, it coincides with the, uh, with the geodesic flow. 
Now you might say, wait a second, is this the right or the left action of G that I've written down here? This is sort of how G acts by isometries on the unit tangent bundle to H. That's the left action, isn't it? Well, it's, you, you see, it doesn't matter because what we're doing is we're taking the identity element here. And then we're examining what AT does to the identity element. But that's the same thing as AT acting on the, on the identity element at the, on, the, on the left. So just by looking at how the derivatives of these Mobius transformations move tangent vectors around, we can check these assertions. So similarly, if we take, apply the horror cycle flow here, this uh, vector will move to um, uh, uh, HS of uh, V will continue to point be a unit vector pointing straight up, but now it will be at the point I plus S, having moved a distance of S along this horror cycle. And that, of course, is again, it's the same thing as taking the derivative of this map here, which acts by Z goes to Z plus S, and applying it to the vector. So that's the uh, NS applied to V. And for the, for the elliptic flow, Again, it's more or less obvious. This um, subgroup here, our favorite compact subgroup, is just the stabilizer of, um, of the point I. And as we've seen, its derivative uh, is rotation by theta if we, if we use theta over two in defining the matrix. Okay, so we've now have a geometric understanding of how these three groups act on G when G is interpreted as the upper half point. And we're going to use that to understand their dynamics. But to get some, some um, intuition for what's going on here, I want, to, I want to prove a couple of theorems for you that have nothing to do with dynamics. So here's a theorem. It's called the polar decomposition. And this theorem says G equals K A K. Okay, now what does this mean? It means K A K is just a set. So it's the set of elements of the form K A K prime, such that K and K prime are in big K and A is in A. And so it says that every element of vessel 2R can be factored as a rotation as two rotations acting on the right and left on a diagonal matrix. So it's diagonal up to the action of the rotation group. And there's a similar theorem called the Iwasawa decomposition, which says G is equal to K. And the usual way to prove these theorems is to mess around with matrices until you've done the proof. But let me explain why they're true geometrically. So what does it mean that G is equal to KAK? It means that if I start with my favorite vector at I, and you give me some other vector, some other unit vector W, somewhere in the upper half plane, then I can get there by first applying the elliptic flow, then the geodesic flow, and then the elliptic flow again. And here's how you do it. You take these two points, and you join them by a geodesic. Any two points, distinct points in the upper half plane determine a geodesic. And, and then what you do is you first apply K, a rotation to B, K to B. So you look at KB, and now it's tangent to the geodesic. And then you apply the, the geodesic flow for a while, and you get over to this vector, which is BKA. I'm right acting on the, on the uh, right as we're supposed to be in this analysis. And uh, now I'm at the right point, but I'm pointing the wrong way. And so I rotate once more, and, and I get W is equal to K, A, K prime. So that's all this decomposition says, is that you can get from one vector to another by joining them by a geodesic, rotating so you're parallel to it, applying the geodesic flow, and then rotating so you point in the right direction. That's a proof, a geometric proof of this polar decomposition. 
What about this thing KAN? <laughs> That's kind of wild. So we're supposed to be able to uh, do this by applying a rotation and then the geodesic flow and then the elliptic flow, uh, the horse cycle flow. So that will be a slightly different picture. Uh, so again, let's take B to be our standard vector. And uh, now just for fun, I'm going to make W point like this. And then uh, in anticipation of what I'm going to do, I'm going to continue W until it hits the boundary. Uh, take the geodesic through W and then construct the corresponding horocycle. And uh, the reason I like to do that is that I now know what all these, uh, all the vectors in the n orbit of W look like. They're the ones that are, can't, that are orthogonal to this horse cycle and pointing inward. And now I want my poor guy B to get onto this horse cycle. So what, it, what I do there is I draw the geodesic from I to the center of the horse cycle. And so now I can apply K to B uh, and get it to be tangent to this geodesic. And then I can apply the geodesic flow to move it from here to here, where it's now orthogonal to the horse cycle. And then I can apply the horse cycle flow to move it over to W. So that's V K A N. And that proves you can get from any point in G to any other by the combination of these three flows. Um, okay, so I think working these out a little bit by hand helps you get some facility and intuition with the meaning of these, uh, these group actions. And once we have that firmly in mind, it will be pretty easy to do the ergodic theory. So we'll, we'll prove mixing uh, in, in our next uh, lecture. Okay.